blacks were using guns, like all slave catchers. They believed that African Americans could not handle uh, independence or civilization or the rights of citizenship, that they could not control themselves. Ida B. Wells called out the tired old lie that black men rape white women. Welcome back to In Sickness and in Health, a podcast about health and social justice. I'm Dr. Celine Gounder. This season, we're looking at gun violence in America. The 13th, 14th, and 15th Amendments, the abolition of slavery, equal protection before the law, and the right to vote. These amendments to the Constitution made big promises to Black Americans after the Civil War. Yet, despite having gained these rights under the law, Black Americans were plagued by white supremacist terrorism in the decades after the Civil War. Lynching was the most notorious mob violence waged against African Americans. Today, we're going to look at the stories white supremacists told to justify lynchings, and how this history of domestic terrorism shaped the way early Black civil rights leaders viewed guns. We're going to start our episode in Abraham Lincoln's hometown, Springfield, Illinois. It's August 1908. A white railroad engineer has been killed. The alleged killer, a black man, is in jail awaiting trial. It's a hot, sticky, late summer's day in central Illinois. People are on edge in the heat. Then something sets the city off. A white woman says she's been raped. She blames a black man. Quickly, a lynch mob forms. The sheriff sees there's going to be trouble, so he secrets the two black inmates in his jail away out of town. The mob is furious at having been outfoxed. They turn their fury on the black neighborhoods in Springfield. An oral historian named the Reverend N. L. McPherson recorded several interviews with African Americans who lived through that riot. This is an interview with Mrs. Maddie Hale in her home on April 30, 1974. The interviewer is Reverend N. L. McPherson. Now, Mrs. Hale. Uh, Maddie Hale was a little girl living outside Springfield that summer. The riot then, you say, was in 1908. Now, could you tell me something about it? Yes. Mm-hmm. It started on Friday evening about 6 30 p.m the riot was serious for three days the white mob rampaged through the black neighborhoods in springfield the national guard was mobilized but the riot raged on homes were burned businesses smashed Mm -hmm. during the night two negro men were murdered namely Mr. William K. Dunnigan was hung to a tree. Mm -hmm. Mr. Burton, not known, his given name, was shot to death. Mm -hmm. Those two men were married to white women. It was no coincidence that someone like William Donegan, a black man with a white wife, was attacked or that the original target of the lynch mob was a black man accused of raping a white woman. Allegations of black men raping white women were often cited in lynchings. Lisa Linquist Dorr is a dean and professor at the University of Alabama. She studies one of the most common justifications for lynching in our nation's history. The rape myth itself is this idea that black men had a propensity and a desire to rape white women. White supremacists argued that without the institution of slavery to, quote, civilize black men, they would violently attack and rape white women. Lisa adds that Reconstruction era Americans saw rape differently than we do today. They saw it as um, something that was a fate worse than death, um, but they also saw it as an attempt for black men to access power that they could not have otherwise, that this was perhaps um, the most uh, brutal, raw way to attack white supremacy and the power that whites held over African Americans. 
Lisa's research showed that there was a gender hierarchy, as well as a racial one, driving the rape myth. I think that uh, white Southerners would define the appropriate social order as one in which uh, white men are at the top. Um, they care for and support white women in, in the, as wives and mothers and daughters. They sort of embodied the benefits and the civilization um, of white supremacy. They were um, beautiful. They were um, uh, benevolent. Um, they were pure. Um, and they held themselves above the sort of baser, coarser human instincts. And so in some ways, I think that they were a repository of whiteness. So the racial hierarchy and the gender hierarchy, they're embedded. So mob violence hid behind a story of protecting feminine virtue. Part of white supremacy is a patriarchal control of women. An attack on a white woman was such a blow to white supremacy that it justified the most stringent and, uh, you know, full-throated response that would justify the tremendous violence of lynching in which there was incredible amounts of torture. Social class was another important factor when it came to how violently a perceived attack on a white woman's virtue would be defended. Not all white women were equally white as I say, and that their own behavior or the behavior of their family could make them less worthy of protection. For those women, they could find that the, that, that protection that came with being a white woman could be ripped away from them if they didn't behave according to those mandates. And so in many ways, they, in order to merit the protection of white men, they must behave according to certain values of morality and chastity and respectability. Lisa said her research showed the courts generally upheld a woman's version of events in these rape cases. But the severity of the punishment had a lot to do with the accuser's social class and reputation. It was not uncommon for once the jury had rendered its verdict for the legal officials involved in the case to write the governor and, and be very candid about how uh, much value uh, they placed on the woman who made the accusation. They may say that um, that she might be trash. They might say that she was immoral in other ways. They might say that she did not have a good reputation for chastity. They might say that she came from a poor or disreputable family. All of those things could be used to justify essentially giving the convicted African man, American man a break. The rape myth was a tool for terrorizing black men and controlling white women. But the greatest threat of sexual violence was to black women, often at the hands of white men. And when a black woman tried to defend herself against a rapist, she could be the one who ended up in trouble, especially if he were white. Take the case of Lena Baker. Lena Baker was um, an African-American mother uh, in rural Georgia who, in the 1940s was employed to help take care of a white man who was convalescing from an injury. So this was an older white man. This is Caroline Light. She's a lecturer at Harvard. We talked with her in a previous episode about guns and gender. Lena Baker had to endure physical and sexual abuse when she worked for the Knight family. Ernest Knight would hold her prisoner and demand sex. There are many uh, witnesses uh, that, that this happened, that there had been a sexually coercive relationship between the two of them. One day, Lena fought back. In the struggle, Lena Baker shot and killed Ernest Knight with his own gun. She was actually tried in a court of law, but her trial was a farce because she certainly didn't have the benefit of a jury of her peers. Lena was convicted of murder and sentenced to death by an all-white, all-male jury. She is the only woman ever to die by the electric chair in Georgia. She was eventually, decades later, pardoned, <laughs> long after the fact, after her life had been taken. Um, but she's an excellent example of how the so-called natural right to use lethal violence in self-defense has never been universally available to all people. But the rape myth wasn't the only thing driving violence against Black men in the decades after the Civil War. Competition for jobs and business was another. During the race riot in Springfield, some black shop owners used guns to protect their homes and businesses. 
Edith Carpenter was another black girl living in Springfield during the 1908 riot. Her family owned a general store in town that served black and white shoppers. She told the oral historian, Reverend McPherson, how her father handled those tense nights in 1908. My sister's husband got a whole lot of ammunition together, guns, big long guns, and a whole lot of the bullets and everything, and he bundled that stuff up and got it to Springfield. The audio is a little hard to understand, but Edith says her brother-in-law snuck guns and ammo into their father's store. Edith's dad sent her and the rest of the family out of town during the riot. Then he took two rifles and stayed behind. He had a gun on each shoulder, and he marched from where our store was on the 15th and Adams to our home where we lived at 1312 East Monroe, and that was back and forth all evening. And so Edith says a group of rioters started coming down the street towards their family store. And I'll let you know they came right straight down that street, but they certainly didn't bother me. And he was ready for them, I can tell you that. And he sent word, if you come here, you might as well know that I'm going to take care of myself and what I own. And so they didn't touch, didn't come near him. Not everyone was as lucky as Edith's father. Scott Burton, the man Maddie Hale said was shot at the top of the show, he was killed trying to protect his business. But Edith's story shows how dangerous things could be for a black family and how gun ownership could be the difference between life and death for a black person. One of the earliest public advocates of black Americans carrying guns for self-defense was the abolitionist and former slave Frederick Douglass. What Douglas was uh, describing was this phenomenon of uh, slave catchers coming into the North and uh, essentially kidnapping people um, in free states, indeed in states that had their own uh, state laws that uh, prohibited recapture of uh, slaves. This is Nicholas Johnson. He's a law professor at Fordham Law School in New York who studies black Americans' tradition of gun ownership. What Douglas was uh, suggesting was that um, freed slaves, uh, escaped slaves, um, uh, free people in the North uh, should resist to the death the, the slave catchers and, and should, should fight to defend their freedom and their lives. After the Civil War, former Confederate states passed laws limiting the rights of newly freed black people. One of the most common laws was a ban on African Americans owning guns. The rationale was fairly straightforward. Um, it's hard to subjugate people uh, when they can defend themselves. So the idea was that if you're going to terrorize them, you know, first disarm them. Um, and um, it, gave, it gave lots of, of, of whites with the imprimatur of the law uh, the authority to, to attempt to disarm blacks. The black Americans had a real need to defend themselves against racist terrorism being perpetrated by the likes of the Ku Klux Klan. Union generals still stationed in the South were tasked with protecting their Second Amendment rights. You know, when people talk about how, you know, we've never really had kind of you know, government tyranny that justified um, uh, the, the need for, for arms, uh, they just ignore uh, this whole period of, of, of our history. I mean, I think this is a very, very good example uh, in our history of uh, uh, tyranny where individuals who on a daily basis uh, were, were using arms uh, to face down uh, the, the oppression and, and the, um, essentially the criminal activity uh, that was uh, occurring under the authority of, of state and local governments. The ratification of the 14th Amendment in 1868 extended equal access to gun ownership for black Americans, at least on paper. Not even a decade later, in the U.S. versus Cruikshank, the Supreme Court would limit those rights. The Cruikshank Supreme Court decision came about as a result of, or in the aftershocks of, a very violent white supremacist uh, race riot um, in Louisiana, Colfax, Louisiana. Caroline Light again. We don't even know today how many people were killed. Could have been as many as 100. Um, could have been more, um, but in that moment, it was essentially the state conspiring with white supremacist organizations to violently suppress 
um, an interracial political alliance in Louisiana. So the Crookshank case was essentially where the families of those people killed were suing for responsibility for those who had instigated the attack. Three men were indicted for crimes related to the massacre. The 1876 Supreme Court decision sided with the defendants. And at the end of the day, in the uh, majority decision, um, the Supreme Court said that actually, no, the Second Amendment does not guarantee an individual right to have and carry firearms. It also ruled that the protections of the 14th Amendment only extended to state action, not to individuals. This meant that federal laws passed after the Civil War to prosecute white supremacist terrorism were no longer constitutional. In this legal environment, African Americans had tenuous rights to guns for self-defense. They also faced local law enforcement that could be complicit in terrorist attacks against blacks. That was something Ida B. Wells discovered when she was living in Memphis. In 1892, she witnessed the lynching of three black men, including a close friend of hers, Thomas Moss. It was a lynching uh, that occurred as a consequence of uh, blacks basically starting a business that was in competition with one of the, uh, with a white merchant who um, was, was selling in an area that was sort of integrated. Uh, Tom Moss is brutally, uh, lent, I, I'm going to call it lynched, but he was, he was gouged and burned and, and just, you know, I mean, he was tortured to death. Those lynchings in Memphis spurred Ida B. Wells to become an investigative journalist who documented lynchings across the South. But it also prompted her to buy a gun for her own protection. Wells was, was quite uh, explicit about how uh, blacks should, should respond to this sort of thing. Uh, Wells said that the Winchester rifle deserves a place of honor in every black home. And what she was talking about was essentially the assault rifle of her day, and just in terms of, of ballistics and, and uh, the capability of, of multiple shots. The Winchester rifle that she was talking about uh, compares uh, favorably to, to modern semi-automatic firearms. At least seven people were killed in the Springfield riot. Two victories. But the man who was accused of raping the white woman, the allegation that set off the lynch mob in the first place, he was set free. His accuser admitted that she'd lied. The 1908 Springfield riot prompted the creation of the National Association for the Advancement of Colored People, the NAACP. Many of the NAACP's founders, early civil rights activists like Ida B. Wells and W.E.B. Du Bois, were strong advocates for black gun ownership as a defense against racist terrorism. So armed self-defense was a major focus of the NAACP's early work. Many of its first big legal cases were over this very issue. There's another story, um, again, of somebody defending their own home. This was Dr. Ossian Sweet. Could you share that, that story? Yes, 1948, I believe. Ossian Sweet was a black doctor living in Detroit. He decides he wants to buy a house in uh, what is essentially a white neighborhood. He had been living in, in a place called Black Bottom that was basically a black slum. As, as Sweet attempts to, to move in over the course of a few days, uh, there are a couple of, of uh, uh, efforts to, to throw him out, and then eventually there's this huge, essentially this riot uh, outside his home, hundreds of, of, of uh, people outside his home. Uh, the police are basically looking the other way. And you know, people don't know maybe this, but the, the, um, yeah, the Klan was, was a very powerful force um, in Detroit at, uh, at the time, and they had already thrown a couple of other people out of their homes. Just months before, another black doctor was thrown out of his house when he tried to move in. He was called a coward for running. And OCM Sweet, uh, uh, when he moved in, said, well, you know, I'm not, he was afraid of being called a coward. He said, yeah, I'm, we're not going to run. Ossian's family stays in their new home, despite the mob's threats. Then after several nights of harassment, someone in the crowd starts to throw rocks at the house. 
the sweeps are inside, they, and, and people dispute when the first gunshot uh, is fired. But ultimately, a white man in the crowd ends up shot, ends up dead. Asian, his brothers, and his wife go on trial for the killing. The NAACP gets involved. They hire the renowned lawyer Clarence Darrow, the same lawyer who defended John T. Scopes, the teacher in the Scopes monkey trial. And the Sweet family gets off twice. The NAACP parades Ossian Sweet around the country as an exemplar of uh, how blacks should respond, essentially, to this sort of discrimination and threat. And they raise, a huge, for the time, uh, a huge amount of money. And, and you know, James Weldon Johnson, who was, was the, uh, the executive director at the time, uh, used the, the, this, that money as the seed for the development of the, the famous today NAACP Legal Defense Fund. But that, uh, the, the defense fund was, was funded. Uh, as a consequence of, of black folk rallying to the, the aid and support of uh, this fellow, who, again, was pursuing this tradition of arms in, in the way uh, that a variety of others uh, had. Asin remained a public figure, but he also suffered a series of personal tragedies. His wife and daughter both died. He ran unsuccessfully for political office. And then, right on the cusp of the civil rights movement, Ossian Sweet shot himself. It's tragic that, that he you know that, that he killed himself. Um, but it, it also raises the sort of you know dichotomy um, that that uh, transfers into the, the modern era. That, that is the you know the, the gun can be a tool of, of righteous self defense. Uh, it also can be the instrument of, of tragedy which is, is uh, what we see in uh, many uh, communities today. The decades after the Civil War were among the most deadly for blacks in our nation's history. Whites didn't want blacks moving into their neighborhoods or competing with them for jobs or in business. White supremacist organizations mushroomed. Lynchings and other domestic terrorist attacks against blacks peaked. And meanwhile, the government did little to protect African Americans from this violence. Next time, we'll continue the story of African Americans' relationship with guns. The civil rights movement was famous for its nonviolent tactics, but guns played a critical, largely unknown role in supporting leaders like Rosa Parks and even Reverend Martin Luther King Jr. Today's episode of In Sickness and in Health was produced by Zach Dyer and me. Our theme music is by Alan Vest. Lift Every Voice and Sing, written by James Weldon Johnson and composed by J. Rosamond Johnson. It was performed by the Southern Sons. Additional music by the Blue Dot Sessions. Audio interviews with Maddie Hale and Edith Carpenter, care of the Oral History Collection from the University of Illinois Springfield Brookings Library Archives and Special Collections. You can learn more about this podcast and how to engage with us on social media at insicknessandinhealthpodcast.com. That's insicknessandinhealthpodcast.com. If you like what you hear, please leave us a review on Apple Podcasts. It helps more people find out about the show. I'm Dr. Celine Gounder. This is In Sickness and in Health.